Hello, everyone. My name is Lisa Allen, and I am one of the co-founders of the Notebooks Collective. We are a virtual literary arts space focused on community, connection, and continued learning. We have future events listed on our website, including our next In Conversation on April 23rd, featuring poets Jose Angel Aragus, Quentin Collins, and Daniel B. Summerhill. The Notebooks Collective believes that Black Lives Matter and acknowledges that as a virtual organization, our offices are on the unceded lands of the Kickapoo, Massachusetts, and Pawtucket tribes. With events that bring people from all parts of the US, we encourage you to check out this map and share where you are in the chat. We also want to note that we stand in solidarity with the people of Ukraine and against colonization and war in any form. We hope you enjoyed tonight's event. I'm going to turn it over to Rebecca. Thank you, Lisa, so much. Um, I wanted to kind of give a little bit of a run through about how this event is going to go tonight. Um, but first, my name is Rebecca, and I am the other founder of the Notebooks Collective, um, along with being a poet and communications person. After I introduce Soledad, um, we're gonna have her read for about 10 minutes and then we'll start the conversation. Um, and we hope this conversation will prompt additional poems to be read. Um, in addition, if you have questions to ask, you can please send them along to Lisa um, and she will ask those questions on your behalf after the discussion. Okay, so I am so happy to introduce uh, Soledad Caballero. She is professor of English and co-chair of the WGSS program at Allegheny College. She is a Macondo and a Canto Mondo fellow, has been nominated for three Pushcart prizes, was winner of the 2019 Joy Porjo Poetry Contest by Cutthroat, a Journal of the Arts, and the 2020 Swims Swim for the Fun of It contest. Her poems have appeared in the Missouri Review, the Iron Horse Literary Review, the Crab Orchard Review, and other venues. Her collection, I Was a Bell, which we will hear her read from tonight, won the 2019 Benjamin Salter Poetry Prize, Saltman, sorry, Saltman Poetry Prize from Red Hen Press in 2021. She's an avid TV watcher and a terrible birder. Another thing that makes me happy about this event tonight is that I met Soledad in 2006 in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, we had both signed up to take Rebecca Morgan Frank's master class in poetry at a writing center called Grub Street. The workshop was made up of poets who trusted each other deeply, which was such a pleasure to experience. Um, at the end of our 10 weeks together, I believe it was, uh, I solicited poems from everyone to make a chat book in which we asked Morgan to write the introduction. Um, and of course, 16 years later, I still have it. Um, I reread the introduction tonight um, where she writes, the steady intelligent voice of Soledad's image rich work. Um, this is still a great description of her work though it has matured much since we've last workshopped. Um, in her new book, she visits spaces no one can access anymore, reaching into her past to evoke the horrors of Pinochet's Chile and the upheaval of immigrating to the US. Threaded with these poems, threaded with poems about cancer, she definitely parallels these two journeys, both of which violence and harm initiate. What I take away from this book is that always where there is heartache, there is love. Um, that class bonded me with poets I'm still connected to and that we still champion each other's successes. And to that, Soledad, I'm so thrilled you are here at the Notebooks Collective to discuss the new book and all things writing. Thank you. It is so exciting to be here. I, I, I'm sure I have that chat book in my like area of the world, right? That's sort of uh, <laughs> <laughs> like the world of my life. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Was, and I think we took two classes with in the with in the introduction that I read. Yeah. It was like there was a six weeks and then there was yeah. a two weeks and then there yeah. was, the, yeah. So yeah. that we had spent a, a lot of time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, I just, it was very striking to me how like Morgan was very spot on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'm thrilled to both be here and share this evening with, uh, with both Rebecca and Lisa and so honored that y'all would invite me. Um, I'm going to just read a few poems okay. um, uh, if that if that works and then mm -hmm. we'll kind of dive into into the conversation. So like Rebecca said, 
you know, I started this work in real kind of serious ways in about 2014, you know, kind of dabbling. Um, and then um, I was diagnosed with cancer at the end of 2015. And so then the book sort of became a, an attempt to sort of grapple with both of the, I think you used the right word, um, Rebecca, journeys. Um, so I'm going to start speaking of, of that, though. I think ultimately this book to me is about memory. And so I'm going to start with a short poem um, about that called Pacific Dreams. Pacific Dreams. How long since my body carried joy, since my hands, my legs plunged into the cold ache of the Pacific? How long since my bones felt the bite of the water, its sting of sand and seaweed? Strange dream ocean, it leaves me breathless, this memory. Eyes closed, head submerged beneath the waves, dark cocoon of foam and salt engulfing everything. Beneath the waves, my body a muffled, quivering heartbeat. So when I was a kid in Chile, um, the ocean was really important. My grandparents had a, a beach house. And so we would travel there a lot. And um, some of my best memories are of the coldness of the Pacific. And I remember when we moved to the States and finally um, got a chance to go to the ocean. It was the Atlantic Ocean because we were in, on the, on the um, East Coast. And the water is not cold. I know people think the water is cold in the Atlantic, but at least in the part that I would swim in, um, it was not cold. And so I still have that that sensation of, of the body um, being so kind of being bit bitten by the ocean. So um, the second book I'm going to, uh, the second poem I'm going to read, I don't read that often, um, but it's, it's about flying and about journey. Um, if you know anything about me in any capacity, um, and maybe you'll know this right now about me and you can use it later, um, is I actually hate to fly. Um, I hate flying in kind of this visceral way. It feels very unnatural to me to sort of be in a state of flight. Um, and yet, of course, my journey as an immigrant and my journey in the professional world and, and how I connect to the people that I love is through flying. Um, so I have several poems in the book about flight. Um, and so I'm going to um, read this poem that interlaces what um, they often say to you at the end of flight when you're getting ready. This is called Flight. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome aboard. Please pay attention to the following safety announcement. This plane is equipped with six exit doors, two over the wings, two at the front, and two at the back of the plane. Take a moment to locate the nearest exit closest to you. Note that the nearest exit may be behind you. Remember the ex exits in case you suddenly realize there is no way you can stay on the plane. It might be easier to leap into the blue and white than face the onslaught of your in-laws, their sour stares waiting for you just beyond the gate. You might be better off not arriving Enjoy instead the prospect of escaping their bird jabs about your work, your childless womb and choices. The cabin doors midair, a welcome chance to land somewhere, anywhere else, even if the jump kills you. In the event of a loss of cabin pressure, oxygen masks will deploy from above your seat. Place the mask over your mouth and nose be sure to secure your own mask before helping others and children. If you left your child with your husband, your mother, to take a completely useless trip for work, try not to think about her. 
crazy wild girl who runs around the house in her underwear, a wand, a Halloween wig from two years ago, though it is the dead of winter. If you managed to convince yourself, your mother, you did not want children, remember you believe it. Still, put the mask on safely, knowing you leave no one person attached to you for those early months of sleepless love. Tell yourself you have other joys. Though the bag may not inflate, be assured oxygen is flowing through it. Flowing like sadness at the thought of not seeing your niece again. She has no idea your mind traveled to her at this moment, 35,000 miles above the ocean. Or to the summer you taught her to fish, play hopscotch outside behind the garage. She stained herself with chalk all week. Every dress, every t-shirt marked with dusty pink blue pastel handprints. Unabashedly, she asked for ice cream dinners every night, spit out all the broccoli you steamed. She made you laugh despite the waste. She made you love your dirty clothes and mops. If there is a loss of cabin lighting, floor lights will enumulate a path to the nearest exit. This plan for illumination is not likely to bring much clarity about your writing, the empty pages you leave behind, pages you tried to ink but failed every day to write. Instead, you managed chaos, laundry, taxes, the grocery store, the pharmacy, the farmer's market, the kids' sleepovers, summer camps. The floor lights will not lead you to the words left undiscovered, the words gone missing, the tangled syllables of your father's silence, secret like underground roots, love, forgiveness, grace, lingering vines never planted. In case of a water landing, your seat cushion is an approved flotation device. Simply remove the seat and hold it tight across your chest. Ignore the tightness in your chest, anger, anxiety, the thought of plunging into water, an empty dark desert without having taken a moment to look at your husband before you crawled out of bed. Avoid thinking about the five minutes you wanted to hold him, but did not. Feel the rhythm of his breathing, the way his mouth stays slightly open when he sleeps, the way his hair shoots up from the pillow, how he smells like wood, soap, his body the promise of your days, your nights, his body a furnace no matter what season. Life vests are located beneath your seats. Simply pull them over your head and walk to the nearest exit. Do not inflate your vests until you have exited the plane. The beacon light will automatically flash once you are in the water. It will not be the ocean of your childhood, the Pacific. So cold, so biting, it burned your bones with cold even in summer. You were a fish, mermaid, brown and freckled, making pets of crabs and starfish killing them every week with your love, but every week trying again. Your grandfather warned you they needed the salt, seaweed, to survive. He never stopped you, let you torture those sad creatures. How little you knew of loss, of leaving, never to return to that time and those years. He would die the year after you left, that small country behind. The captain has turned off the fasten seat bell sign. You are free to move about the cabin, but as rough air can happen, suddenly, please keep your seat belt secured tightly across your waist when you are seated. When you feel the clasp of the fabric and metal around you, you sense the turbulence 
The plane defies gravity, stays in the sky, mocking you with promised death, real and coming, if not today. Looking out the oval window, you recall your days, months, and years wasted in worry. A sad poison, like a river snaked rope around your heart. Envy, guilt, regret, muses of dirt and sadness shackled you to small cement wonders. Suspended 35,000 feet above your life, the plane reminds you of death in every cell. You become a prisoner of metal and steel regret. In living, you erased the sky. Why is it on the ground you forget the lesson of flying? So that is, in a nutshell, what happens to me when I fly is I basically look around, and I have another poem from this second book I'm working on, and I'm like, oh, these are the people I'll probably die with. OK. Um, and so like, I just sort of you know, do that. Um, and so because I have this kind of primal memory of flying when I was a, a very young kid, and I knew enough to know, even at the age of seven, that hurtling across the sky in the, in the tube right was probably not you know normal right in any kind of way um i don't want to interfere with maybe I'll, maybe I'll just read like one more and then we can sort of start um yeah, that sounds great okay um so as you know um this is my hair now right and it's completely gray it wasn't gray before i got sick um and there was a period of time where i didn't have any but there was a period when it started to grow back that it started to grow back this purple blue and nobody could explain it my oncologist was mystified my radiologist was mystified and everybody just kind of wanted to look at my hair because it was this weird color and so um i wrote this poem called ode to my hair in in sort of thinking about that. It was dark, wild, coarse brown red curls. It hung a long thick rope behind me. A way to hide, a way to be seen. I pinned or braided it in summer. It was not a crown, but it sparkled, made my whole self feel whole. This rope, a talisman, when I clung to, when I ached for signs of beauty in the mirror. So I never lived as if beautiful. No dark forest queen ever envied my face, eyes, lips, skin, voice. Still, she might have given a kingdom for my hair, raged through fire, ravaged hold fields with ice, to have it, my one spark of Venus. Then, one day, months into chemo, it was gone. It fell out at night in clusters, on the brush in sad globs and dead clumps, like bits of wood, burned, ashen, like abandoned gray ghouls behind, left behind after the battle. There was no stopping it. All locks vanished, no more waves of color and curl, bare, empty like a field without poppies. I had nothing to cling to but a strange, bright scalp. A year later, new growth, new spirals hang, dangle like crystals below my shoulders, glowing. Strangers on the street ask, is it real? No way to hide. Chemicals made me otherworldly. Coils of slate blue, gray, purple mixed with white. Alchemy of medicine and time. Thank you. This is the, hi, how are you? Hi there. <laughs> It's me trying to do too many things at one time. No that was so, so cool. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm so excited to talk about this. Um, I feel like the, the first thing that I wanted 
I guess there's so many different ways to approach this. Yeah. And so um, I think the first thing that I was kind of thinking about was um, we talk about journeys mm -hmm. and, you know, um, uh, the idea of um, uh, like a journey for the book itself, like how you put the book together, like did you initially conceive your manuscript to be about one particular thing and how did it kind of change and evolve yeah. um, when you were writing it? Yeah, you know, I have thought about this answer, right? One of the things, of course, is it's all in retrospect, right? Because when you're in the actual middle of the process, you're just like, I have no idea what is happening, right? right. You're sort of just, um, you've done this, right? When we're putting books together. Um, so I started with the idea that I was just going to write a few poems. Okay. I was just thinking maybe it would be a chat book, you know, or just kind of a series of poems. I wasn't necessarily thinking about it as a book. And I started with poems um, like Losing Spanish was probably one of the first poems that I wrote for the for the book. Um, and, and sort of just... Um, I was in a, in a workshop and it just sort of happened and that was really exciting. Um, and then I sort of kept writing um, and I'm a slow writer in some ways, like I'm a, I'm a fast producer of crappy bad drafts, right? Like I'm, I'm a very good right? bad first drafter, right? That's like so important to be able to get at least the first draft out. Yeah. A lot of people can't even. <laughs> yeah, no. And I actually loathe like in a visceral way, right? Even though I know it's like the right thing to do. And in fact, where real writing happens, the revising process for me is, is torturous. Like oh, interesting. I really, you know, um, I have gotten better at it and I have learned to appreciate it and uh, this is where my students, I have so much empathy for them because, mm -hmm. you know, they come to class or the office hours and like, I don't want to do this. I'm like, yeah, I know. I don't want to do it either. Um, so I wrote a few poems mm -hmm. and, uh, and I thought, okay, this is going well. And they were about memory and immigration. They were about Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And then I got sick, mm -hmm. um, you know, a year and a half into that, into that writing. Mm -hmm. And it became a way to anchor myself mm -hmm. through being sick, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. So the journey became about making sure that I could still write because chemo really screws with your brain, right? Mm -hmm. It sort of does stuff. Um, so it became a way for me to think about something that wasn't being sick. Mm -hmm. um, and that's when I started yoke, yoking the idea of immigration and memory to the idea of cancer, because both of them are about memory, mm -hmm. which is, I think, how I thought about putting the book together. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to write a cancer book, but I knew that I couldn't really avoid writing about what was happening, too. Mm -hmm. um, and so I started thinking, and I'm still thinking about cancer in this way, um, I started thinking about it as like what the body physiologically kind of remembers from experiences of being sick, even mm -hmm. if you can't quite articulate it. So oh, it yeah. became another way to think about that. Right. So I put it together like that. Okay. Yeah, I could see that like the body, we all, we know that we carry with us physically the memories that we've had um and so that makes that's such a brilliant connection that like of course our body also remembers that yeah um and it also felt like a way to um like pull yourself out of your body mm -hmm. potentially and look at it in like a kind of holistic way without being in it so to speak. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of, you know, I'm such an American immigrant in this way. Cause like when I got sick, um, when I got sick work, working on something that mattered to me and was meaningful was actually really important. Mm -hmm. and so I did a lot of work. I was on leave, but I did a lot of writing. I did a lot, even though I was also desperately sick a lot. 
but uh, and then especially after the year after like 2017 mm -hmm. I was on sabbatical I traveled to Santiago I did a whole bunch more research I read about the book I read about Chile I read about work um, and so uh, about um, what was happening with Pinochet and it became another way for me and I'm going to sound very cliche but after I was sick and then I was able to not have evidence of disease I had always wanted to write a collection and I thought there are people who didn't make it mm -hmm. like in a lot of ways right whether through the violence of the state or the violence of disease mm -hmm. um, so I sort of really forced myself to imagine it as a book yeah no I was gonna say that violence in a way does play a, like a large part of the manuscript, you know, yeah. in that the state violence that forced your family to flee. Um, even in Richard Blanco's blurb, he talks about your unflinching witness to the emotional trauma inherited from war ravaged Chile to the exiled plains of Oklahoma, as though to witness is to love. Um, and then I also noticed that in your poem, In Poison Time There Is Love, you write every moment of blood and pain everywhere there is love. And I, I see that in the tenderness in which you write about um, the victims that you, you would not have never met and never um, had the chance to, to love in that way. Um, but I think it's, it is like a, such a powerful emotion. Um, and could you talk a little bit about that, about like, just everywhere there is love? Sure. I mean, well, first of all, right, we were not forced into exile in any official capacity, right? Okay. It just is the case that um, things converged. And so in, in 1980, it made sense for us to stay. Um, but the thing that happens when you're an immigrant, especially out of a place like that, or it happens to me, is there's a lot of silence around it. Mm -hmm. like why you did leave or why you didn't leave. Mm -hmm. um, and um, there are lots of Chilean folks in Canada and in, in Europe, right, who did, in fact, have to leave in, an, in a very explicit way. Mm -hmm. um, but to stay when you didn't want to stay, right, is a kind of way of, of sort of thinking about this. And, um, and so I think that for me was really important. You know, I was seven. I was very young. My memories of Santiago, my memories of being in Chile are actually beautiful because they are cocooned, right? I have a poem about this, right? The spell, right? They're cocooned in this, in this wonderful kind of um, soft and warmth sort of mm -hmm. space. Um, and then to be sort of ripped out of that and sort of like, for whatever reason, as a child, it's quite... Mm, difficult it, it's a it's a mark it marks it right and so then um everywhere there is love i don't know another way to think about poetry and i don't know another way to think about memory right if if it isn't about love i work with a scientist in my in my professional life um and she studies um memory and and she tells she's taught me and she sort of continues to teach me that the way we think of the way we do memory is every time we remember something, it is a new memory. The brain, in fact, remakes it. Interesting. Which so I love that because that's basically writing, isn't it? Like it's, right. You're revising right? constantly. <laughs> yeah. So I, I love that. And so for me, this is this is a book of love. And actually, um, it's a book about memory and a book about love. And I don't want to it's a book about thinking about the future. Mm -hmm. Like I, in the, in the collection, there are a couple of poems to my sister's children yeah. and, and, um, and they're, they were a very clear audience for me. Like I wanted them to have like an opening beyond the book that was like, Hey, this is where you could come from if you wanted to anchor yourself in this, mm -hmm. uh, in the, in, and then it's also where you leave from, right? You can move beyond it. Right. Which is why I finished the collection with Rooted because the second generation or the 2.0, right? I'm a 1.5er, right? I was little yeah. when I came to the States. Right. That's what we're sort of called, right? The, and I'm 49 now, so I'm old, right? Mm -hmm. um, but my sister's kids, right, are the 2.0 and um, they don't have a lot of the same relationship to 
to immigration or to sort of being quiet about speaking Spanish. They're, mm -hmm. you know, they're Gen Z. They're like, no, that's stupid, right? So, so there's a lot of sort of revising about that too. Right, you know, I, I, and I see like the, the poems that you have about childhood are, are definitely like very warm and, yeah. and um, you totally, there is that sort of sex, ah, feeling of cocoonness, yeah, feeling secure. And that, I guess, is a really good juxtaposition of that feeling ripped from that to mm -hmm. come to Oklahoma, mm -hmm. when in actuality, like outside of your cocoon, yes, was like this really kind of intense stuff, right? And yeah. yet, my I loved living in Oklahoma. Like, let me just be clear, right? I met people that I still are consider family. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's this interesting way in which it's it's only in retrospect mm -hmm. that that want like living in Oklahoma was great. And in part, it was great because I thought it was temporary. Mm -hmm. We thought it was temporary. And then we ended up staying. Um, but I have fond memory like. I know it's going to sound strange to say this, but Oklahoma 1980 to 1984, living in married student housing, it was an incredibly diverse and international community that I lived around. And then the friends that we made, the family friends that we made there, um, that we are still very close to, right? Um, they were wonderful, incredible people. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's also this sort of, again, this strange juxtaposition of knowing like Oklahoma in the structure of the United States mm -hmm. and then Oklahoma in your private kind of personal life, um, which is how I think of it. Um, well, I think that's, I just thought immediately when you were talking about like the childhood and being in this incredibly diverse community, um, your poem, Alien Magic. Yeah. Like, like there is such the, like, it was, happy and and that just the idea of debates about <laughs> yeah that's all made partially kind of right poets license but yes we would we right like i have very wonderful memory like in married student housing we live in a teeny tiny apartment but we had neighbors from iran and neighbors from ethiopia and neighbors from south korea mm -hmm. and then across the way from venezuela and, and Paraguay and Uruguay, and then people that were from Oklahoma. So I didn't you I didn't have a sense of the United States as like the United States, right? Mm -hmm. In the same way, even though of course there was oil everywhere and right. Yeah, that's that's kind of what I was thinking about when I read um, what was it Immig immigrant confession? Yeah, where that is kind of like the juxtaposition of uh kind of like the u.s and its expansion and its colonialism being celebrated as this like manifest destiny um but not realizing what comes you know underneath it at the time um i just i thought that was a really i mean there's so much of our education from the 80s that we're like oh we would not be taught that today but um yeah <laughs> it was just i don't know it's it, they were just really interesting to me about how do you find one's how you find your way um i don't know if you find an answer let me know <laughs> i just uh, right i'm still I, I think poetry is a way to enter those conversations mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um i think for me it's a way to think again about the possibility of condensation mm -hmm. of those memories um but the book, you know, but the but it in some ways for me, what it, what feels very expansive about the book is that it crosses so many different borders. Yeah, which is how I think about what it means to be an immigrant, but more privileged. And so I have papers, and other people don't have papers, mm -hmm. and I am completely fluent in English, but that that means there's shame about Spanish, and right there's a lot of, I guess what I would say is. There are so many different stories that there's not one immigrant story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I think I, I have a I have some questions about form and, and things mm -hmm. like that. But before we before we get to that, because I noticed when you said about having papers and like mm -hmm. to document was like a great poem, kind of investigating the way we how we are remembered and like how we signify who is a human being that belongs to a family or a country. So 
that was that was really great. I just I wanted to speak a little bit about your sabbatical because I think that is like a really unique experience to be able to like do that kind of research. Mm -hmm. Um and like what was it like visiting like is it Villa Grimaldi? Villa Grimaldi. It is a super surreal experience. Um because so I did a lot I I visited it and then I did a lot of research and then of course I did the tour um at the site and it was first of all just the juxtaposition it was a beautiful day in early spring so the sun was out the sky mm. was beautiful and clear right and it's called via grimaldi park and so on the one hand it's this commemorative site and there are all these things that sort of indicate that but in my research what i and again i'm not a historian but like in the research i did about it um, when the dictatorship was ending, one of the things that was very, what the, what the government wanted to do was erase the mm. sort of spaces, right? So there has been a whole campaign since then to sort of maintain the spaces so that it's not forgotten, right? And so Villa Grimaldi was a private home. And then one of the things that I realized is that like all the places, there, these weren't like let's make camps or let's make sort of places to kind of like, it was sort of done, right? There were spaces that were used for other things. It was a home. And then it became this really horrible sort of place of torture to sort of move prisoners around, right? And then when it was time to, um, when the plebiscite happened and Pinochet was out, sort of told, no, you don't get to come back. Um, you know, there was a whole kind of desire to erase what had happened and and so when i went to via grimaldi it was beautiful it looked like a park it they had to recreate the places like rebuild like this was this place where this happened and this was the tower where that happened the yeah. only it the only thing that was still there was the swimming pool mm -hmm. because it was a house right mm -hmm. um and the tree and it was, and it's this beautiful tree, right? And then the 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 people who are commemorating the site are, you know, they bring tours and schools. So when I was there, there was clearly a class, and they were looking at at a wall with sort of um, names of people who've been disappeared. So it was just this incredible, weird juxtaposition because it was a beautiful day. The park itself, you wouldn't know. Right. I think that's one of the things that is true, I think, historically, is you, you, when you speak to people in that time, they're like, we didn't all know what was going on. Right. Because these things were happening amidst life. Right. It was like kind of de not, um, decentralized in a way. Yeah. So yeah. And it was amidst other stuff. And so while there was the kind of, I, I, this is my guess from what people, what, from the people whose first person perspectives I've, who's like, uh, memoirs I've read, but like on the one hand, yes, there was that reality of the dictatorship, but on the other hand, there was life and people mm -hmm. just kept doing life, right? While all this other stuff, I, I think, I know this sounds weird, but I think of like kind of what we do now with the pandemic, <laughs> like, like we know people are dying, right? Mm -hmm. And we know that horrible things are happening right around us. And yet, you get an email that you have to go and do this thing and you get, you have to go pay your bills and you have, right. For some right. of us who are privileged enough to have that. Right. Right. I imagine it's not dissimilar. Right. That's there, kind of that there is, there's also that kind of, um, maybe that belief that it's not going to happen yes. to you. And yes. so like, as long as you keep doing what you're doing, yes. you're probably fine. Yes. Um, and that, yeah, that is definitely something I've noticed in the pandemic is that, you know, if, if it doesn't touch you or you're not at higher risk, then like yeah. it's really easy to kind of separate yourself from the whole. Yeah. I mean, again, I think one of the things that I am aware of is like, we all think, oh, we would never behave in this or that way. And I think I'm not sure anybody can make those claims <laughs> until one is in right. those spaces. Because those, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, wow. Thank you. I think that that was like, I did a little reading about the place 
myself. I mean, obviously yeah. I'm reading like Wikipedia. No, yeah. Listen, Wikipedia is great for this right. kind of stuff. But um, I mean, that's the other thing. Uh, you asked me how the book was put together. That poem, I did so much research and that poem is very small, yeah. right? It's this kind of, you know, 10 lines couplet. And yet, you know, it was a lot of watching of documentaries and reading and, and thinking. And, and yet, so that's the other thing that happens is like, the poems themselves don't always reflect what's happening underneath them either. Right. Yeah, no, I, I think though, what makes that poem so like, is it starkness, you know, mm -hmm. that it is like, it, it isn't this long, like, yeah, you're able to kind of condense the horror, if you will. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, and sometimes it's that kind of like coldness that makes it so hot. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I wanted, there's one particular poem that I was really sure. going to talking to you about, which yep. is the, um, memory spaces. Oh yeah. Um, so like kind of fascinated by this idea of, is it Pecha Kucha? The Pecha Kucha. Yeah. Yeah. So that's like, um, like a, a way of doing slide presentations. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, Pecha Kucha is this, you know, uh, professional, uh, six minutes, 20 slides. Okay. Right? And okay. so you, you do a presentation, six minutes, 20 slides, but Terrence Hayes, brilliant mm -hmm. poet that he is right. Yeah. Um, sort of created, invented this idea of the Pecha Kucha poem. And he, um, I think it's in his book, lightning head kind of wrote oh a sort of Pecha Kucha about, uh, an, an art installation. That, okay. that he that he was in. And so when I was taking a workshop at Grub Street Writers, um, <laughs> this was an option, right, to sort of write uh, an ekphrasis or a, or a Pecha Kucha. And um, I liked the idea of merging them. Yeah. And so I wrote um, this, uh, Pecha, this Pecha Kucha based on the work of Dolores Salcedo. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, you, you don't need to, or I experienced her work in a very visceral way. So I saw them in slides because a lot of her work, there's some work for, of hers at like the Fog Museum now in Boston. So actually mm -hmm. you could go look at um, like Piel de Flor is mm -hmm. in fact there, right? So it's okay. a beautiful, um, it's, um, th it's uh, stitched um, flower petals that look like, like a shroud. Okay. Right? And then sort of it's supposed to evoke a shroud and, and the way it was installed as, as I was reading about it is that then it sort of covers over a body. So she does a lot of work in memory and with mm -hmm. thinking about political memory and gendered violence and hers are a lot of kind of, you know, three-dimensional installations. Mm -hmm. um, so I was very drawn to her work. And so then I tried this form that is basically 20 vignettes that are kind of ekphrasis, which is to say they respond to a piece of hers. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's sort of the basics of no, it. No, I, because I thought that was, I thought it was, I love the, I love when poetry talks to different other. People. I do too. And my, yes, yes. And the yes. fact that it was then also layered upon this other form yeah. was just like, and that then I know like the title is a piece of work, but the then the like snapshot is from memory. Right. It, it, yeah. It, I mean, really, I don't yeah. have much more to say. <laughs> it's, oh my God. Um, I love, cool. yeah, I love the picture because you know why I like it? Because it's, um, what I like to think about is it works kind of like memory right it mm -hmm. each stanza or vignette is one pixel or one part of the larger thing and mm -hmm. you need both to sort of make the whole and i really love the I that idea and what is memory if not just threads of vignettes threads mm -hmm. of images threads of words strung together I right. think it's the backbone in some ways of how I think about writing. Yeah, I, I think I just was like, I don't know, I was just really blown away by that. <laughs> and like, um, it's also then, good for writing and practicing. Like well, that's the I other think, part. Right, form, form is one of those things where like, I feel if you get stuck or if you're having trouble, like forcing yourself to work within confines is like yeah. an excellent way to either like get something out on the page 
that matches the form or get something out on the page that looks like nothing like it, but at least you, you did it. And then, you know, like there are other things that I noticed, like your ode to your, to your hair. And, um, I'm not, I like the, uh, use of text, you know, this, yeah. other, um, the CIA reports, mm-hmm. the medical diagnoses, the mm-hmm. flight attendant announcements. Like, mm-hmm. I think that's a really interesting way of taking this external text that is, you know, in that kind of, um, what's the word for just like flat voice or <laughs> <laughs> yeah my sort word of recall. reporter or like the yes. yeah the sort of instruction voice right or sort of like the yeah my re- my word recall is it's not so hot this day. <laughs> um so and then kind of like threading into this more emotion the emotional heat of like the actual experience was like um really really interesting um so that was another another one that I was struck by um and I guess the question I have is like, did you like, were there instances where you were like, this is the form this poem needs to be into? Or were you more a writer? And then you're like this. Yeah. Now I need to change the poem's form based on the larger. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I knew that I want the poems that have, first of all, I actually think most poems are polyvocal. Like mm-hmm. even when we are writing in our writerly voice of the self, right? We are also a collection of so many of the other voices that we've read and Mm -hmm. engaged with, right? I I actually think poetry is a much more um, intertextual, multi-textual thing, even when there is, you know, the sole author, right? And so part of me, part of it is I, I know I'm in collaboration with the texts of my life, even the texts that are like, I pretty much have memorized those like flight instructions, right? Because right. I hate flying so much uh-huh. that I kind of like speaking of words becoming part of your body, right? They are embodied for me. Right. Um, so, so for those, I knew that I wanted a kind of call and response. Mm-hmm. Um, I think also for I was a bell, the titular poem, um, medical diagnoses are so um, sucked of, heart right Right. like if you if you sort of go to um in my case it's my chart right and it's sort of like have all the sort of things that have happened to you and you click on the link right it's like symptoms include right and it's just kind of these lists of things that in so many ways erase what that means right to the person to the family on the body so Yeah. yeah i think that um that was one thing is uh Oh, what is it? Um, in my chart, like this, your spine was unremarkable or your spleen was, and that was like the word they use to be like, you're fine. There's nothing to remark upon. But I just always chuckled at the fact being told that I was unremarkable right Right? if you think about it you're like oh not worthy of comment okay (laughs) (laughs) yeah so I love in fact my second the second I'm thinking more and more about kind of the language of medicine and the the language of diagnoses right Mm -hmm. um let me be clear I am grateful for the medicine that I received I'm grateful for the care I got and I'm incredibly grateful for the scientists and and sort of experimenters who sort of managed to do this. I do think that they would benefit from talking to a humanist on occasion about like the humanness of what it means to be diagnosed, right? Right. And so I think poetry is actually a great way Mm -hmm. to sort of cut through that. Yeah, no, I think that is, there was like, I was listening to something where they talked about how um, like, 94% 94% of doctors or like students in medical school don't know what pain is, like how you yeah. get, like what is pain. Yeah. And that was like really striking to me to think like, here are people like talking to me or talking to, you know, patients and they don't have a concept of what is like really, ex- you know, happening. Right. And yeah. also then of course you think about all the structural issues if you're a woman, if you're mm-hmm. an older woman, if you're black, if you're mm-hmm. poor, if you're queer, if you're trans, right? You start overlaying um, um, sort of those those things. Yeah, uh, 
narrative medicine, right? I read a critic called Rita Sharon, and she does um, she does um, not just narrative medicine, but she has a PhD and an MD, and wow. so she teaches students in medicine, right? They use art to actually talk about pain, so they'll look at kind of Renaissance pieces of art where there's a body in pain, and they'll talk about the body not just as a as a site of diagnosis, but as a site of humanness and what that yeah. means. What was what was her name again? Her name is Rita Sharon, okay. um, C H A R O N, and um, she has several books. But my, the one that I like a lot is called Narrative Medicine. Okay. Um, and so um, it's really um, a way to sort of. I'm an interdisciplinarian, right? My work is is I like to synthesize. I like to sort of bring things together. Um, I think the multivocality of the poems for me is also kind of that, right? Yeah. I, I know I'm not speaking on my own. There's so many around me and, and who have helped me. Right. Yeah. I think that that is, there's always like we're, poetry is always in conversation. It's always yeah. in response. It's always like, uh, you know, cause each person is a amalgamation of all their memories and thoughts and impacts of other people. So yeah. I, I, I'm really, I, I definitely agree with you on that. Um, I think uh, I was going to ask Lisa if there were any questions from the audience, because not that we're running out of time or anything, but just in case there were. I have not received any questions yet. So if anyone has some, please send them to me and we'll make sure that uh, Soledad and Becca can answer them. Yeah. Um, Lisa, do you have any questions yourself? Because I know that you have been thinking about this book too. I have been thinking about this book. I've been thinking about not just the subject matter, but I'm so in awe of the different forms that you used. Um, mm. I feel like there's lyric essay, there's sonnet, there's one that's not a huzzle, but it was very huzzle-esque to me, <laughs> which I thought was beautiful. And I'm wondering if you can speak to, to that, whether it's your thought process or if you think about form first or later, I know you, kind of did a little bit. I'm really curious. Yeah. So um, I'm in a wonderful um, poetry workshop in Pittsburgh, uh, Pittsburgh, uh, the Squirrel Hill Poetry Workshop. And um, they helped me a lot think about form because my first impulse, sometimes I have a sense that, you know what, a couplet is the right thing here, or mm -hmm. this I think needs to be have some breathing space. I have been, in fact, playing with form more. Um, I actually am really interested in form. Um, I'm very inspired by people who are incredibly good at form and then good at inventing new things within form, right? Um, I find that sort of like superhero status, right, in a way, right? So, um, but I do like what I think about, when I think about form, I think I, think about multivocality or polyvocality. So for me, form is about trying to make explicit the other voices that are part of this, even if they don't seem obviously part of this. Um, but I love, I love, um, I love being given the prompt of trying to write in form, right? Um, so what I think earlier you said, Becca, um, when you don't know what to write, right, when you're feeling stuck, right, um, try something in form, right? So like at the beginning of last year, maybe it was two years now, I was just in a period of fallow, right? I just thought I have nothing to say. There's nothing going, like there's nothing interesting I can talk about because it's just, you know, horrible life, right? And so I said, oh, you know what you should do is do a sonic crown. <laughs> And so I spent a long time just wow. writing a sonic crown because I thought, well, that will force me to think about the form mm -hmm. and, and kind of be the gateway to push me out of whatever this kind of funk is right now. Yeah. And it turned out to work really well. I, I was, it's a terrible sonic crown. I don't even know that I'll ever, I got a piece or two of it as a single sonnet, right? Um, and I'm not a good sonneteer in the sense that I am terrible with um, rhyme scheme. I don't follow a traditional rhyme scheme. I generally tend to follow at least the quatrains and the and the couplet or the Petrarchan, right? It's eight, seven. Um, 
but I love the idea of pushing form and playing with form. And even one of my poems that I'm working or that I worked on last year moves the like the text looks like a wave because I was trying to think about kind of like movement beyond the page. So that's yeah, that is something that I think I struggle with a yeah. lot is um, moving away from the left margin or or breaking in like lines and like and not kind of having a form that you can see. Yeah. You know, there's poets like um, like um, Lely Long Soldier who like mm -hmm. her poems are yes. like going around. The yeah, thing. and and yeah. I'm always like. That or Anthony Cody, his most recent book is is in, some of it is sideways and like it interweaves like part of this poem like comes back later, right? Um, and so yeah, um, I'm in awe of those things. I think I'm a more I think I like form because I study it because I have studied it in literature, right? I am inspired by the forms that I've studied, um, mm -hmm. the sonnet, right? The ode, the lyric, the, mm -hmm. I love the, um, I love the ghazal, right? Because it's also like a folk form, right? Like it can be, it's also voice, right? Which I think is what poetry, right? Poetry comes from the song, right? It comes from ballad, right? Sonnet means, comes from sonetto, which is little song in Italian, right? So, um, so yeah, form for me is something I struggle with. I don't write the first poem usually. It's usually a blob, right? Like the first poem is called the blob. And <laughs> then from there, right? Like I try to maybe think sometimes the blob stays, um, but often then I'm like, yeah, okay. This is obviously just your first try. Right. Um, that's so encouraging because that's my first drafts are always <laughs> blobs too. So. Yeah. And then try to excavate from there. Well, if it's any consolation, I when I took a uh, class on revision with Ellen Black, Ellen Bass, like she oh. showed us blobs. Mm. <laughs> right. so, yeah, I mean, I really like the idea of like the blob. Like, what could you do with a blob now, right? Like, I'm actually really interested in that. Yeah. <laughs> I think there are definitely moments like where you you find where you've let your editor down like it's gone for a second and there's like a little spark of something mm -hmm. um because you're just like because mm -hmm. i think that's i think my conflict is um having the editor come in too soon and like start changing things before yeah. anything gets fully realized and i i think in it in a way maybe your hatred <laughs> or loathing of revision might be like a a good well, it's not a practice I encourage. It's just that it's the truth of what I do. And then, and then if I'm distant enough from it, right, then I can yeah. go back and kind of be more biting, I think, mm -hmm. is, the, is the need. Right. right. The distance thing is really interesting, but I wrote down earlier your distaste of editing, and I'm wondering if you have other, for people who share that um, dislike, do you have oh, yeah. other tips or, or processes that you could maybe share? Uh, for revision? Yeah, I mean, I trust, there are readers I trust. Like I, I my, like I said, my Squirrel Hill poetry people are so good. I trust them with like, usually a first draft of something. And, and I also, and there's such a diversity of readers and a diversity of writers and such an incredible sort of breadth of experience. Um, I think that um, the other thing I do is I'm a really good student. So, you know, the way to um, to worry about revision is to sort of force yourself to do it on someone else's time clock. And so I, I sort of put deadlines for myself, right, externally, and then sometimes even just kind of having accountability. And honestly, I believe in workshops, like fundamentally. Mm -hmm. um, and so I am always trying to sort of be in workshop space in some capacity, whether it's informal with just a writing group or more formally when I'm like, okay, you need a kick in the butt right now. You need to do something with this. Um, and, um, you know, tricks and tips, I, I just think you have to know why you're writing, 
And I, I have to say that I still don't know sometimes why, when I don't know why I'm writing something, then that's a real moment for me to sort of say, maybe you need to put this away, or maybe mm -hmm. you need to revise this into something that you know why you're doing it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. No, I, I immediately thought um, about <laughs> when you were talking about this, uh, accountability, I yeah. think it's something that um, when I was in school, there was those external deadlines and I love being a student and yet like being outside of that frame, it's been, it's, I think something that Lisa and I have talked to about like, how do we, how do we encourage each other and others to generate work mm -hmm. when we're also so busy yeah. with everything else, like Absolutely. you want to be kind to yourself and, yeah. and things like that. Um, so, so like, uh, true story, I signed up for um, to Sylvia Press's prompt a day for like poetry months. And so they've sent me now four prompts. Let me explain to you that I have not written a single poem for poetry month yet, um, but I'm saving them. And I'm like, well, they're there for the future. Or maybe I'll get to a prompt, you know, April 15th. I don't know. Um, I think that you have, I think there's not one trick for anybody. I think the most important thing that I've learned is that I have to figure out who I am as a writer and be honest about that for myself. So you were saying, Becca, like, give yourself grace or sort of give yourself space. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I'm not a disciplined writer in the sense that I don't write all the time. What I do is read all the time. Yeah. And, I, and I consider that part of writing. Yeah, I think that is something that, you know, I was, I was kind of, um, thinking to myself the other day, like, you know, there is, there is the writing time where you're like, where you can definitely be like, I'm a writer because I'm actually doing the work right now. But then there's the work of revision. And then yeah. there's the work of reading. Then yeah. there's the work of reading other people's, like workshopping other people's poems. Right. And then there's the work of being a literary citizen and like That's showing right. for other people. And, you know, so like, as it's long, all part of it, I think. It's all, yeah. And yeah. so I think there is, there is a, we can get trapped, I think, sometimes in thinking that we're not doing enough if we're not writing every day, when in actuality, like, we're probably doing one of those four or five things all the time. That's right. Yeah. Um, since we're talking about writing, Arlene did post a question. She wants okay. to know if you read contemporary poetry in Spanish. I wish I could say yes, I do, but no. <laughs> like, um, write... I, I have, I'm pretty fluent in Spanish um, and I um, can read, you know, your general newspaper, or kind of your general prose, but poetry is uh, for me kind of a next level, right? And, um, and so I, sh I do like having translation, right? So like if there's a bilingual book in Spanish and English, I like having both of those. So like Lorca, many Lorca mm -hmm. editions will have that or Neruda editions or Gabriela Mistral editions. Um, but I am very um, unfamiliar with contemporary like Chilean or um, uh, other Latin American poets, except for the folks I know who are like me, who sort of are American and also Costa Rican or American and Argentinian. And so I read their work, um, but it's not, uh, all, it's not kind of first language Spanish work. It's usually sort of hybrid work. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah, that's, that's a great question. Thank you, Arlene. Um, Lisa, are there any other questions? That come through okay well i think it might be a good time if time to read more, yeah to read more because yeah. we'd love to hear um okay your poems and okay. I'm, so I'm gonna like lisa can you make me go away because <laughs> if i do uh, it myself, i like say thank you okay um so i um i'm gonna read a poem that was going to be the title of the collection and then my my press sort of said that they wanted a different title. It's called Birds of Prey. My first bird was a dove, but I did not know it. In Abuela's bird cage, I held it hatched new out of an eggshell the color of sand. She had many birds with feathers, light and thin, like fingers. 
the partridges in their regal browns and grays, the songbirds, specks of voice and dance, bright reds, vivid yellows, oranges like the sun over the Pacific, doves in pairs with wide eyes and wheat colored wings nestled in the upper shelves of the cage. Her birds seemed infinite and wild. They lived in the walk-in cage, separated by wood and wires. They sang into dusk, a gaggle of voices waited for escape. Two, some days I hid in the bird cage. The ground smelled of wet straw and bird shit. I sat next to the bird feed cupped the body of my bird in my hands, a talisman of heat and eyes. It wrestled helplessly, head jerking in jagged circles, its beak a dark stone, an arrow moving to find flesh, a jab of blood wound, a jab, a jab, jab a blood wound into my seven-year-old hand. But I was firm. I wanted its secrets, its love. I was a patient warden. Somewhere in the bird's bones was magic, a spell at least, an incantation, a melody to break the general, his hard smile. The bird was my weapon. Abuela's gentle fingers peeled away mine. My grasp was rough. Her whispers soft. She said, Déjalo ir, mijita. But I needed its fragile warmth, its breath inside my skin. I was young, knew little of the world and its poisons, but I sensed emptiness and fear, the soul missing from the soldiers' boots and guns, the green tanks on the streets the silence and hunger of those who turned away from love, ignored the strangled limp bodies beaten blue, thrown into the river, stacked along the walls inside the camps. The, the coup was also seven years that summer. Still, its ash rained through the city, a blanket of gray soot. It clung to the crevices of all hearts, latched itself to every muscle. Every day I cradled my bird, its hollow bones, pulled it close to my chest, inhaled its musk and waited for song and spell to wake us into living. I waited for hours, crushing my bird with hope. Three. I sat in the birdcage every day the summer before we left Santiago, stared at all the birds, their delicate bodies and wings knew nothing of my sadness. Abuela promised to keep my bird, to watch it while we flew to a flat land with white snow in January. One morning, the light still low and slight on the horizon, I forgot to latch the door. The birds danced out into the sky. The cage suddenly empty, its door a sad tongue hanging open. Abuela left fruit and seed, hoping to lure birds back. Weeks passed, we often heard their singing near as the sun fell through the horizon. They never came back. We left in March. It has been decades. I never returned to the birdcage. Now I look for birds with claws, beaks that kill. Um, so one of the things that um, that this collection has are birds, right? The, the cover is a bird. Um, and there's a lot of sort of bird imagery and also flight. And, and it's because I. That is something that definitely emerged out of my living in Northwestern Pennsylvania um, because I commute on 79 North and South uh, every week. And there are many, many, many birds of prey 
um, like. And even now that eagles are coming back to this re region a couple of times uh, as I'm driving down the road, I see, um, I even see bald eagles. Um, and so I love birds and I love birds of prey, which as, as I understand it, if you're a birder, like a real birder, right? Birds of prey are not necessarily something that you love do, watching. Um, in fact, in my neighborhood, there are a couple of hawks that sort of live in my neighborhood and I have a bird feeder and sometimes I'm like, oh, it'd be great if the hawks would start kind of eating these birds. So I'm very much, uh, um, so yes, so I love birds of prey, um, but I'm a terrible, like I don't have the patience for learning the sort of, I've learned it many times. I like open Wikipedia or have like 10 books, guidebooks of birds. Um, and yet I somehow managed to forget all of the relevant facts. Um, but birds for me sort of end up being really important. And it did not occur to me until very late in the writing process, when I started writing about birds of prey, um, that in fact my grandmother was loved birds and had birds when i was growing up and so i remembered returning to the cave uh to the cage when i was a kid so i've been told that this po that this collection of poems is really sort of a downer um i think right that that's sort of depressing and i, I, do <laughs> I don't see that i would say that i find it like there are there are parts of me that go oh yeah. man what were what the us is responsible for or things right. like that but overall there's such a resilience in it that yes. like yeah that's yeah. upper i that's agree upper. i think my i think this is an upper right yeah if we're going to talk in sort of terms so i'm going to read a couple of like the lighter poems maybe um so we can sort of end on a on a good note so one of the things that um in 2016 when that happened um, is that um, my friend said to me, what are we going to do, right? Like, what's going to happen? How are we going to sort of deal with what's going on? Um, and so she charged me um, with kind of figuring out, like, she said, what are we, and I, and she said, what are we going to do in the meantime? And so that is where this, this poem comes from um, in the time of the patriarch for Amy. The boots march in step, armies of sadness each day, a day closer. All seems to stop, but the time of the patriarch. Cancer cells grow like strange vines, bouquets in blood, swimming in black lanes like pinballs in a maze. Turkey vultures cut through bullet steel skies with finger wings, looking for possum carcasses and squirrel heads. Butterflies lost at sea, throw off, thrown off track by gusts, pulse their battered wings in aimless circles. In the meantime, we will cling to the world of light. Look to the sun, talisman, sign of the ancestors. We will birth our bodies out of sky dust and heat, constellations bursting through black holes. We will sprout, sprout song out of our mouths, crucibles of joy sounding out the blood waves of our stories. We will become myth, Medusa, Cleopatra, Guadalupe, inhabit mitochondrial time, live out of fire and breath. Machines and madness tell only the end of time. We will tell the time of mothers and daughters. We will keep the time of love. Um, so, of course, if you, if you know Latin American poetry or writing, you know um, Autumn of the Patriarch, right? Gabriel Garcia Marquez. And so I was thinking about, about that um, as well. So um, I'm one of the things that I'm trying to work on is writing explicit love poems um, which are very actually hard to write i don't know if that right like because you're trying to say something that isn't a cliche and you're trying to sort of find something in the texture of that love and so this next poem was my one of my first attempts and my second collection that i'm working on has more love poems and i think i'll i'll finish with these two love poems and call it a night <laughs> 
<laughs> um, <laughs> so the first one is when you go out to walk the dog. Um, you call me at 10 14 p.m. I think he has been kidnapped or shot or maybe it is aliens or wild dogs. Someone is dead or he lost his shoe in a sinkhole. The dog is rabid or maybe the dog is the dead one. Come outside, you laugh. You are standing on the lawn holding a bag of shit and the dog leash. You say, look, look at the moon. And I do. Um, and so that is very much a way of thinking about love for me. Like I think about love as disaster and sort of what are the right, if you hear the phone, you're like, what's going on? What's happening, right? And then my spouse is very much like, uh, it's everything's okay, right? And so, um, so it's those. I think love is about the quotidian, um, the sort of the sort of moments in between the moments that we think are the big moments. Um, so this is a new poem uh, from my next book, I hope, um, and it is called "Obeyed for Ricardo." Um, and an obeyed is just like a song about waking. It's a poem about waking, it's a sort of old form. Um, you look calm, like the ocean before the wind catches it, shakes it awake, wide with sound and aching. I have not slept for hours, red-eyed in the darkness of the night, my brain unable to catch sleep, my thoughts like bullets bursting out, erratic, staccato speculations. I watch you as the light breaks open through the blinds, noting the movement of your mouth, your eyes, your rib cage, studying the heat of your skin, the heat of your mouth as you dream and sleep into the next dream, the next breath. I lie with you, my heart choking me my will shaken as I watch you sleep, scared to wake you, scared not to wake you, caught knowing that one day I will lose you, one day you will not wake. And in that moment of terror, when the light is just casting its light on your face, I wish for one thing only, that we face death together, that both of us take the ride into Hades hand in hand in that boat no one ever gets to leave and we sing so thank you so much for spending all this time with me i really appreciate it and thank you again to lisa and to becca for um for hosting yeah no i'm really really happy um, to have you and if, if everyone would like to you know take a moment and say hello and, and thank congratulate, you so much. that'd be great We'd love to see you. Yeah. <laughs> and please sign up for the Notebook Collective. Their readings are going to be amazing. Next, uh, when is the next one? April 21st, you said, Becca? A April 23rd. We're going to be hosting. Um, actually, a fellow, a uh, Canto Mendo fellow. Um, nice. Jose, um, Jose Angel Aragus. Um, he has a new book called Rotura. Um, so yeah, it should be, it should be a really great night. And I think, um, my, my closing remarks were essentially like, please buy Soledad's book. Um, so we have shared, uh, a link to your book in the chat, but if you have any other like social media handles that, um, people might want to have, you can definitely throw those in there too. Um, and that, yeah, uh, we hope that you will do as Solidite suggests and follow us and yeah. join our mailing list and learn more about what we're doing. Yes. And I loved, yes, love the new poem, the, the, the new poem. Wow. Yeah.